So uh, I'm Dan Mitchell, and uh, I have the honor of interviewing today Professor Donald Shoup uh, of uh, the uh, School of Public Affairs. And uh, he has a very interesting background. And as we've done in previous uh, interviews with other uh, emeriti, we're going to just try to establish some basic uh, times and dates and so on. And then come back and uh, and uh, get into more detail about uh, Don and his uh, very uh, distinguished uh, career. So Don, can we start with born when and where? Well, I was born in Long Beach in uh, 1938. Uh, that was because my father was in the Navy um, and his ship was stationed in Long Beach when, when it had a naval yard. Uh, so I think I lived there for maybe two years, and then we moved to Hawaii, where the ship was uh, transferred to Pearl Harbor. Um, and so my earliest memory in life is the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, fortunately, my father's ship was out at sea at that time with a Hollywood movie company on board making a movie. Um, but uh, Life has been comparatively calm since was December 7th, 1941. Uh, um, but uh, people were evacuated from Honolulu. I mean, the Navy uh, dependents were evacuated. So you, you actually recall this uh, event uh, occurring? Well, I think I do. My parents had, had movie cameras, a movie camera. They didn't have a projector. They just had a camera. <laughs> and they <laughs> movies, uh, I guess they must have bought it when, when, when I was born because they they didn't get much feedback from their films that they, they would take the films to the Kodak studio and the Kodak studio would process the films and then show them to you. Uh, so they got very little feedback on how to, how to make good videos. So they sort of waved the camera around like a garden hose, just aiming at everything. So. The, the the video the cameras showed uh, various various aspects of life in Long Beach and, and Hawaii, and so I think that I remember the attack because I certainly have their movies would be wearing a gas mask and things, <laughs> things like that. Do you have Do you actually have these films someplace or? Yes, yes. So I well, they I think maybe when I was around. I was 30 or 35, I took all the films and spliced them because you know, there were a lot of bad uh, missing parts and black parts. So I, I spliced them the, the way, you know, I guess they did in the old days with, with film. And then, the, and then I think they, so I had the, the, them all boiled down to a few reels and then I had them converted into tapes, I think, uh, mm -hmm. here in LA. And then I had the tapes converted into a, a, a digital <laughs> form. Uh, so I guess maybe there's some de degradation at every uh, every transfer. But yes, we, uh, and of course, now everybody has movies of everything. But uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's interesting to see sort of random shots of Hawaii, the, the, the most interesting a single uh, shot was uh, we were at Waikiki. Uh, my brother and I were, were in the water, and uh, I guess my parents were standing on the beach filming us. And then they uh, panned around and uh, uh, towards the towards the mountains, uh, away from the sea. And then the only thing you could see was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel and two cars parked perpendicular to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the only people in the water. Uh, so <laughs> it, it was uh, a different time. So uh, I was going to ask whether uh, whether any at any point in your uh, life in Hawaii uh, you already had some interest in parking, but I see at least in film you had some um, some preservation of it. <laughs> I, I could retrofit uh, parking into my life. <laughs> right. So how long how long were you in Hawaii? Well, I think uh, we were uh, maybe not more than two years. Uh, uh, then we were 
uh, evacuated all the, they converted the passenger liners into, into almost like troop ships and were packed into the Mariposa, which was one of the grand liners at that time and went to San Francisco. And then my father's ship was actually sunk near uh, Australia. And so he got, um, he was badly burned, but he was saved. Uh, and he, uh, uh, we moved to, he was transferred to the Pentagon, so we moved to Alexandria, Virginia, and I grew up there, oh, for about 45, 44, well, I guess it wasn't that long, six years, then we moved to Guam, where he was, wow. uh, mm -hmm. and then Charleston, South Carolina, and then back to Alexandria, and then I was time to go to college, so I went to Yale for my undergraduate degrees in electrical engineering and economics. And then I had one wonderful year of New Orleans. I thought I wanted a PhD and I thought they were all created equal. So I thought, why not do it at Tulane? And I got there and I really liked it. But I realized that getting a PhD from Tulane was not going to get me anywhere. So I went back to Yale and I, um, uh, got my PhD in economics there. And then I came to UCLA in 1968, when you came, I think. We both came to UCLA. Mm -hmm. and said, um, mm -hmm. yes. I was in a post, as a postdoc, maybe you were, were you in economics or business? Uh, I was in the, in the, the management school uh, in a regular uh, position at that point. Well, I was just a uh, postdoc. So, uh, postdoc, uh huh? So let me just back up a little bit because you said electrical engineering and economics. Yeah. And a lot of people might not see those two fields as exactly uh, convergent. So how, do, how did you conceive them at that point? Well, maybe I didn't understand sunk costs as well as I do now because uh, uh, Yale, Yale didn't have a very good electrical engineering department. Uh, because you know, it's it wasn't a focus of a, of a liberal arts university, um, and um, the, the the assumption was if you're really going to be an electrical engineer, you go to graduate school. Uh, so they had a lot of uh, electives, and uh, uh, one of the electives was economics. I really liked it, so I took several economics courses, and then I decided to stay on for an extra year and get a second bachelor's degree um, and uh, I think uh, maybe the, the biggest advantage of, of, a, uh, of being an electrical engineer is you, you know how to use electricity in your house. I mean everything is electrical now. I don't see how you could be a successful homeowner without having been an electrical engineer. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing about it is you, there was a lot of mathematics and I which turned out to be much more necessary in economics than I had realized. Uh, so maybe, maybe the only talent that I got from it was calculus. At that time, I thought calculus was the most advanced mathematics there could possibly be. And now I realize it's just a, a small, a small uh, little part of, of, of mathematics. Uh, but back in those days, as you probably remember, that most of the economic analysis was about theory and optimization um, and models um, and now transformed into data analysis and big data estimating the effects. So, but I was in the old fashioned style of, of optimization. So I think that uh, it turned out to be a very good uh, preparation for for economics, and also I suppose I'm a bit of an engineer. I like to solve problems. Uh, and maybe that's the biggest uh, hangover from electrical engineering is that I like to, to solve problems that I think could be changed. But, uh, the parking, of course, became a big part of that. But in, in urban planning, I think that I was, uh, parking is not the only thing I've worked on. I, I've had a, a several other ideas that I've written about, and, uh, and I think they would have been uh, terrifically, uh, a terrific way to improve cities if anybody had ever listened. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So maybe we can talk about uh, things other than parking today. So when when you were um, when you were at Yale in the uh, econ program, um, was there some specific kind of way, sort of a Yale school of thinking about things, or uh, how how would you characterize it? Well, there was, but I think you know, whenever you grow up, you you're, you're embedded into something, and that's that's what you sort of. Uh, it, it guides you as to what you ought to do and how you ought to behave. And um, we once had a, uh, Yale had a lot of visiting lecturers. That was one of the nice things about it. And there was a guy came from, where did he come from? I think he came from the University of Virginia, uh, which was uh, then called a Chicago school, as well as UCLA was. Uh, uh, the, the Milton Friedman branch of, of economics, and he he came to UCLA and he I mean to, to Yale to give a talk. And somebody in the audience asked him, "Well, if the University of Chicago is one end of the spectrum, what is the other end?" And he thought for a minute. He said, "Well, I suppose it's Yale." And uh -huh. That was a, that was a complete. Uh, Revelation to me, I had no idea. <laughs> I was at a school that was the, uh, the the opposite end of the University of Chicago. But I think at that time there was much less polarization in, in, in economics, that there was a lot more, uh, much people were closer to the center at that time. But say Jim Tobin was the leading, one of the leading lights. Um, Later got the Nobel Prize, and I was his TA, but he never struck me as being you know, liberal. It was at the time when they, when, when Tobin was a leader in it, that they had solved the macroeconomic problems. So we were completely Keynesian, and I, I guess I'm still a Keynesian, um, but they thought that they had managed the business cycle uh, before, <laughs> before things fell apart. <laughs> Yes, I, I noticed uh, uh, I printed out your uh, CV uh, and uh, it indicated that, that when you came out of Yale with your uh, doctorate, uh, you were kind of in a field that is sometimes referred to as public finance and taxation. Now, of course, we all pay taxes, but could you explain a little bit to our audience, you know, what is it that economists think about taxes other than having to be taxpayers like the like everybody else well i think that uh the, the, the other thing i realized when i was at uh at Yale, there was a uh, you know i took the courses in public finance uh and, and one in, in in urban geography which brought me into the land market um but we had a visitor uh well, was it? It was one of the great public finance professors. I'm sure I have his book here, uh, and he he was talking about social welfare functions, and um, uh, and it was quite Keynesian. But he was talking about public finance circa, I guess, 1965. And, uh, so, I remember one of the professors asked him, do you believe there is a social welfare function? And, 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 and uh, not Mills, well, Mills, uh, Richard Mills. No, no, it wasn't Mills. It was, I'm sorry, I don't know what, but uh, he said, yes. <laughs> and the, the professor just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, that's all there is to it. You know, that there's nothing more to hear from you. <laughs> if, you if you think there is a social welfare function. And that puzzled me a, a bit. Um, but I think that, uh, yes, I, I, I guess maybe it was during the, when I was a graduate student at Yale, I became a Henry George uh, when I learned about rent. And that Henry George was a great 19th century, I mean, sort of an economist, not a regular economist. Uh, he was also a politician, but he believed that, that, uh, that all taxes ought to be on land rent, uh, on land, and because of it doesn't distort uh, the behavior of anybody. That, that say a tax on income could be a disincentive to work. Uh, 
or tax on housing would be a disincentive to build housing. But if you tax land, it doesn't, it doesn't discourage anything. And, and instead, it, it encourages you to do something. If you have a, a vacant piece of land and you're paying taxes on it, and that's where the government gets all of its money, it will encourage people to build uh, housing on the, on the vacant land because it won't increase your taxes at all. Uh, and land at that time was much more um, uh, uh, owned by uh, very large landowners. That uh, the people, the homeowners, home ownership wasn't uh, popular at that time. Almost everybody was a renter, uh, a housing renter. Housing was almost all of it was rented. And um, uh, a single tax, as it was called, uh, would uh, increase the supply of housing and bring down the rent of houses, but increase the, the, the taxes on land. And that really, that, I, I think most economists, uh, if there's anything that all economists agree on, I think it would be that a tax on land rent doesn't distort economic incentives. And if you look at the, uh, the, the uh, the incentive to 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 build on vacant land it, it means you you uh, you have a cash flow problem if you don't build because you're getting no income from the land unless it's parking. <laughs> That's right. I think the first time I mentioned parking in any publication was in 1970, and I talked about it as a temporary land use that that, uh, that I wrote my dissertation on the optimal timing of urban land development and, uh, and developers, when they're thinking of when should I develop my land, they, they look at the what would be the optimal size building to build uh, at the time would be single family housing or apartments or, or big apartment buildings or office buildings. Um, that the more capital you put on land, the more rent you would get out of the uh, out of the building, and so. But if you think that the value of the land is going to go up because there will be increased demand for higher valued uses of the future, you will speculate on land and you'll hold it you'll hold it idle until you reach the time when it's the optimal time to uh, to build the optimal building. So, so in effect, in effect, public finance and for economists is uh, has a lot to do with incentives. It's not just paying taxes. It's not just sort of income distribution or redistribution, but it has to do with uh, how people will behave under different regimes of tax systems. Well, that's what Henry George was was a, a big on, and also. It, it probably it would redistribute income from from the richest people to, to everybody else because the, the large land of the Vanderbilt uh, uh, and I suppose the Picos of the Sepulvetas here in California or uh, any big landowner would be probably rich and most of the taxes would fall on them. So it would be almost like confiscate, confiscating the value of land from the landowners. Uh, that's much harder to do now, uh, of course, because land uh, ownership is so widespread, um, and it's it's hard to explain to people the, that if we if we tax your land, it would probably hurt almost everybody in Southern California because our houses are worth nothing. You know, it's just the land. I'm sure that I, I I've never been to your house, but. <laughs> But in our, I suspect we will be the last people to live in our house uh, uh, because it's a one-story house and whenever anything is sold in this neighborhood, it's immediately torn down and a bigger building will be built. Uh, well, that, that's, I'm in Santa Monica and we have <laughs> everybody on our block uh, who moves away is <laughs> one less building and one new, <laughs> one McMansion. <laughs> so, so you... You you would be hurt by a land value tax. Well, especially in California, we have the opposite of Henry George's idea. We undertax land and we overtax everything else. Right. Um, we went from Henry George to Howard Jarvis, essentially. That's right. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, well, I, I want to go back to your career, and 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 you said when you got your PhD at Yale, you first came out to uh, you were at UCLA uh, at uh, at in a research position. Would you say a little bit about that and and what that was? Yes, it was the um, the UCLA. It was the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, which is no longer. Uh, around, but it had a grant from the federal government to look at what was then called program budgeting. It sounded like a very good idea that uh, you would you would try to manage the public sector the way that more like the private sector, I, I suppose. And it was then, I guess, in the uh, Vietnam War, and Mac, Robert McNamara was Secretary of Defense, and he had pushed program budgeting that the budget should be. Uh, uh, I guess, presented to people not as we're going to spend this much on police and we're going to spend this much on health and we're going to spend this much on trash collection, but you would look at the purposes of the, of the government. What are you trying to accomplish if you have a safety? Well, the police are just part of that. I mean, you should uh, think of other things that maybe like um, uh, child welfare <laughs> or or early intervention in children's lives to prevent them from becoming criminals. Um, and so I worked on that for a couple of years. It turned into a book, but I later realized that program budgeting was, was wildly unrealistic. Uh, that it was just an economist's idea of, uh, of an imagined way that governments would operate. Uh, just had nothing to do with the way that governments operated. But I learned a lot from that. And then, and then I uh, worked on that for two years and, and uh, went to the University of Michigan in 1970 and stayed there for four years, except for one, one semester at the University of Hawaii. I, visited, I was a visitor in, in Honolulu for six months. And then I came back to Michigan. And then I got a, an offer from uh, UCLA and the urban planning department, Harvey Perloff, who was a very grand man in urban planning, was the new dean of our school. And um, I had a glancing uh, connection to him because he was at the Resources for the Future, which is still a, that's even much bigger and more important now than it was then. But it was Harvey's idea to stimulate interest in urban economics, maybe even he invented the name, but it was certainly not like, it wasn't taught anywhere, urban economics of cities. And he sort of out of the blue, um, I think maybe I must've been nominated by somebody, but I got a, a fellowship from, a big fellowship from the Resources for the Future for a dissertation on urban economics. So that's how I, uh, focused on land economics. Uh, that, that sort of directed me in the direction I've stayed in. And then, and then he offered me this job at, the, at UCLA in 1974. We've been here since then. So uh, what the, the urban planning at that time was a, a full-fledged school. Um, can you characterize it? Uh, did it have particular leanings or uh, interests? Well, it was a school of architecture and urban planning. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. In building, it wasn't a, a, a department of urban planning. It was just a program of urban planning in the school of architecture and urban planning. And I suppose um, uh, it was, if you're going to think of what's the most left wing in the school of urban planning, that we were in. Uh, John Friedman was the uh, uh, chair, I suppose, at that time. Um, but it was because it was so left wing, it, it, it drew a lot of very intelligent students, you know, who wanted to reform cities. And they, they were so intelligent that they could easily understand anything I was trying to teach. And I taught the economics class for, I guess, almost 40 years. It was a required class in economics that they had to take in their first semester. <laughs> People wanted to come along and hear more about Marxism, and I was talking about marginal econo 
marginal costs and marginal benefits. But I think it, I, it taught me quite a bit that, uh, that, uh, about how to present ideas that you can't expect people uh, to, to just accept, to buy into a, something like, well, I don't know, Henry Georgism or, uh, or uh, more optimizing with economics, say, uh, how, how much public transit sh should you have? You know, well, how much does it cost? Uh, and uh, uh, where should it go? That they, they wanted bigger questions than that. I think they're even, uh, <laughs> well, Harvey, uh, Har Harvey had to defend us from the administration because the students put up, ran up with the Vietnamese flag, North Vietnamese flag in our courtyard. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking pictures of it, and th that didn't go very well with uh, Chancellor Young. <laughs> so, so I think that I I learned a lot about how to present uh, economic ideas to people who don't like economics and who have much different agendas than than, than, than mine were, uh, and it it it, uh, it it taught me a lot. Now you, you, as you said, it was a school that combined architecture and urban planning. Was there integration between the two, or were they really just two separate things under the same umbrella? Not at all. In theory, it sounded great. In practice, it was like sort of parallel play. You know, that we were we had nothing to do with each other. But the funny thing is that, uh, as you remember, the school, our school was, was closed down after Harvey died, and we had a, a new dean, and we were very unsuccessful. And there was a, a proposal to, to uh, eliminate the School of Architecture and Urban Planning and to uh, move architecture into the school, what, what the, then the art school. Uh, and urban planning was combined with social welfare, which was also a school. So they closed two schools and got rid of two deans. Uh, and they have a new school, the School of uh, Public Policy. Um, and the, you were the first chair, I think, of the Department of Public Policy. I was actually, I was actually the second chair, but uh, Joel Hubbard for, yeah. for, for a year. <laughs> and I, I taught the economics course in, 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 in public policy. Uh, for just one year, and then, uh, and then there's been, and then the funny thing is that we realized we were uh, separated from from architecture. We now have a dual degree program. We have a dual degree program between architecture and urban planning, and yet when we were in the same school, there was no dual degree program. You couldn't get a <laughs> go an extra year and get a you know. A degree in architecture and urban. I mean, it, it they seem like two related fields in in some general uh, way, architecture and urban planning. Oh, I think we froze. All right. Uh, I'm going to um, see what I can do about getting us back together. I don't know what happened. Yes, we we froze. It's just one of those <laughs> one of those tech things. I was saying that you know it would seem like architecture and urban planning uh, do have some connections with one another, uh, and yet, as you say, uh, when they were together, they weren't, and when they were apart, they were. <laughs> well, I suppose it's the it's the you know, professionalization of each field that you have to. Publish in the field of urban planning, and, and, uh, and you know nobody except other urban planners would ever read what you wrote. Uh, 
and the architects didn't write much at all. In fact, I think that the most interesting aspect of the combination of the two schools is that the urban planners published a lot and the uh, architects had very large classes. The planners had very small classes, you know, maybe 10 students and the architecture classes would have 50 or 60. So it looks as though we had a reasonable faculty student ratio as a school. And we both had publications. And, um, so as a school, statistically, it looked better than it was when you looked at the two departments separately. Well, now I, I want to move us, uh, since uh, we've inferentially uh, had the word parking, <laughs> it's come up. And uh, that's certainly something that you are noted for. Uh, so uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, when you came to UCLA, how you, you got into the general field of parking and uh, its uh, significance? Well, because I'd been, uh, you know, made so so much aware of the fact that income distribution, income distribution is one of the main things you have to look at, um, and uh, uh, and I guess if I have a a a methodology that 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 shows through much of my work, is I looked at, at places where there's a, a big disconnect between the price people pay and the cost of what they're getting. Um, because if, if something is very expensive to provide and it's free, it'll be overused, it looks like we need more, and, and it, there was a lot of waste involved. Uh, so I tried to look at things where there was a, a, a big disconnect between the price and the cost, and there weren't any external benefits like education or, um, you know, you, you don't expect students to pay the full, the full cost of their education uh, because it has future benefits for the, all of society. But that's not the case with parking. Uh, so if, you, if you subsidize parking, it has a lot of external costs uh, not benefits, um, and it often shifts money from higher, from lower income people to higher income people. And the first one that I looked at was employer paid parking that I had been hired by the California Department of Transportation, no, uh, no, the California Transportation Commission to look at equity in transportation with a co-author. Uh, and one of the chapters I wrote was on employer paid parking. And it turned out that the one study had been done by two bachelor students at USC on the difference in travel behavior between the city, people who work for the city of LA and the people who work for the county of LA. So it was the same kind of job, but they were in adjacent buildings. And the, the county uh, didn't subsidize anything. Uh, you had to pay for parking if you drove, you had to pay for the bus if you rode the bus. And the city gave free parking to everyone. And it turned out that somebody, 72% of LA city employees drove to work alone, and only about 40 of the county workers. So that has a huge impact on, on, on travel behavior. And it, it, it increased traffic, traffic congestion and air pollution and energy consumption and accidents and everything you say you're trying to reduce, but your parking policy works against all of these things. And, and so where, cost where, did, where well. do those policies come from, Don? Like uh, zoning for requiring minimum parking and buildings and well, things well, like that. When, when did that arise? Somebody had to think of it. I suspect that for the city, it had always been there. Say the, the school district uh, gives free parking to, to all school teachers. So you often see the school playgrounds are converted into parking spaces. Uh, I really don't know how long it had gone on, um, but this was uh, what it was when I looked at it in 1975. So I proposed the idea of parking cash out. Uh, which is to say, if you give anybody free parking, not just for the city of LA, but for all employers in California, 
if you offer the free parking, you have to offer the commuter the option to take the cash value if they don't, don't take it. Um, or so they could take the cash value of the parking space of by the bus or bicycle or carpool or a walk. Um, it seems to be fair because it's treating everybody equally. That you're not privileging uh, sole drivers. You're just giving the same thing to everybody. So it seems to be fair for the individual, for all the individuals, and it will help low-income people who can't afford a car or who do take the bus uh, or who carpool. Uh, and I thought, well, this is going to solve the problem. So I, I, I presented this idea, of a, uh, published it, of course, and then when I, I presented it at a conference, and one of the uh, staff members of the uh, assembly member, Richard Katz, he's still around, and a big person in transportation, he, uh, his aide took the idea to Katz, so they turned it into a bill. Uh, and this was the first law that was passed uh, based on, on my research, I thought, well, this is easy. This, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing this. And quite a few of the ideas that I put, uh, you know, development parking have turned into legislation. So I can't always prove that it had any effect, except that it's now legislation. And um, uh, so that's how I, I got into, into parking, because it came through uh, looking at the equity aspects of it. That uh, it, I wasn't focused in on the on the inefficiency at the time. Although now I see it's enormous. You know, it, it, it's a terrible thing to do to say you can have free parking or nothing, uh, because it gets in the way of everything that the whole world wants. Uh, they, we want less carbon emissions. We want less traffic congestion. We want less traffic accidents. And we want less air pollution. I mean, it just goes everywhere. Uh, and nobody was making any connection between parking and all these bigger issues. But for think, example, uh, here in Santa Monica, uh, when people do tear down these single family houses and build uh, larger structures, they're still required by the city, as far as I know, uh, to have, not, have some kind of a garage. Not anymore. No, that's, is, that's, that's, that, is that gone? It certainly was true, and it certainly was true a few years ago. So there was a, a rule. But it, uh, there's more legislation to come, much more. One was that you know, it was passed in, uh, it just became effective uh, this, this year or last year, is that there's a statewide legislation that, um, uh, that no city can impose minimum parking requirements within uh, a half mile of a major transit stop. So now there are circles throughout every city saying that no, the state says you cannot uh, impose minimum parking requirements. And people, you know, there was, there was a lot of opposition in the legislation, including from Santa Monica, that um, that this is a bad idea. This is shifting the, the land use decision from the city where, where it belongs up to the state. Uh, and you know, in terms of what is the distribution of responsibilities, people think that, well, the responsibility should be uh, localized as much as you can. And, and only the bigger issues are decided at the state level. But uh, and land use zoning is often thought of as entirely a, a local choice. Uh, but when you think of it at the, at the state level, uh, minimum parking requirements, you don't listen to the NIMBYs or, or people who live on your block. You look at the, what the bigger consequences for the state are, which and now we're trying to reduce carbon emissions. And it's clearly against you know hard, increasing carbon emissions if you increase uh, parking spaces. So it got through the, the legislature and, and, the, and, the, and the, well, the, you know, the assembly and the Senate and the, and the governor signed it and even had a, 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 a video of the signing saying why it was so important. So now in large parts of California, the, the, the parking requirements are they just wiped away. And then other cities have just 
take it and just remove all the parking requirements, like San Jose, which is the other big sprawling city like LA, that they had pages and pages of parking requirements for nail salons and, and uh, groom, animal grooming studios, uh, the, 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 all total nonsense. But there, it's like uh, the parking requirements, like a, you know, a program running in the background on your computer. You don't know what it is or what it's doing. It has a big effect. And the zoning requirements have affected exactly how the, how the state is built. So that was another law that, that, that got passed. Uh, based on so why parking requirements are, are, are a bad idea. So, uh, let, 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 you know, there have been all these uh, sci-fi films where people have alternative universes and things are different in some way or other. So let's imagine that uh, there's an alternative universe in which, let's say, right after World War II, uh, there had been a a Don Shoup type character who came along and with these ideas and persuaded the legislature and the governor and uh, and and so on and so in let's say 1945 uh, things were done very differently from what they were done here in L.A. and and in other cities uh, at that point. So what would L.A. look like today if uh, if in this alternative universe? Well, I think it would look a bit more like what it looked like before 1945. That there would be there would be a lot more bungalow courts. You know, this was a famous LA uh, uh, land use. There would be six or eight small bungalows separated, um, uh, perpendicular in a courtyard that went out down from the street to the back, and there would often be parking spaces at the back if there was an alley. But, or, or not, maybe there weren't any parking spaces. You were supposed to park on the street. Uh, I think there'd be more things like that. There would be, uh, let's say that to, to get back to what is, uh, we're trying to get back to at the state level, uh, the, now is that in what are single family zones, like where you live, if somebody took their house, they could put in a, a duplex, they could put in a triplex, they could put in a fourplex, saying that we would, they would allow much more multifamily housing, say 70% of all the land in, in, in the city of Los Angeles is dedicated to single family zoning. And that is definitely higher income people. And it means that there's much less capacity uh, to house people, that it means much lower density than, than uh, could than the land could provide. But now the state has come along and saying that you can't do that. The, the, the all single family zoning means at the very least you have to have allow duplexes. And and duplexes were transit uh, uh, built at that point. Uh, we sort of were going in the opposite direction. but uh, do you think that would have been more of a, uh, a push toward, uh, public transit uh, in this alternative universe? Well, yes, I don't know that public transit would ever be a very big part of it, much bigger than it is now. Well, I suppose it'd be certainly more right. I think there'd be certainly fewer cars. There'd be many more one-car families. Uh, now, uh, well, well, the, 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 there are several things that I could point out here if you have some sort of small statistic to illustrate, illustrate what the problem is. And that there's more land per car, for more space per car for housing, there's more space for parking per parked car. There's at least a thousand square feet of, of, of parking for every car uh, because there are at least three cars per person in the United States. Um, and the average parking space is 330 square feet for all street parking. So that's a thousand square feet. But we do have data on how much housing there is per person. It's about 800 square feet of housing per person in the United States. So each car has more space than each human does for housing. Um, and in the recent years, there have been more street car garages in houses than there are um, a one car apartment. I mean, one, one, when you, one bedroom apartments. There are more three car 
garages than there are one bedroom apartments. And that is due to our zoning and parking requirements. So I think if you and stop that, if you've never built for 70 years what we have under the old rule of lots of room for cars and less space for people, I think we would have a much more, the, 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 the people would be more evenly spread throughout the, the, the city. And now we often put all the multifamily housing right on the most crowded streets, you know, Wilshire or Pico or Sepulveda or Santa Monica, where there's the most noise and most traffic and most air pollution. And these are used to protect the single family neighborhoods. I mean, the zoning, they always talk about that. We have to protect single family neighborhoods by putting a barrier of multifamily housing between us and all the, the roads that we drive on. So yes, that's an interesting question. What would be the counterfactual? I think the city would look more like what it did look like <laughs> in the 1930s. I just got this thing. This happened to just arrive in the mail. Uh, it's a brochure from Santa Monica College. Uh, I guess they sent it to every resident of their entire uh, uh, district, college district. And what it's advertising is that you get a free, uh, kind of a free transit pass as a student uh, so that uh, if you come to Santa Monica College, uh, you don't have to, you don't have to drive, you don't have to park uh, because you can take the, the blue bus or whatever, whatever the uh, availability uh, of transit is uh, around the college. Well, yes, I'm a big fan of that. I wrote a couple of, well, three articles on that because uh, I had uh, I had often been at odds with the, the parking service at UCLA, which was built and we have more parking spaces than any other campus on earth for a long time. Um, and we kept building it. The most recent parking spaces, the one under the Muscat Conference Center, cost $84,000 a space. <laughs> um, and, and all the other underground parking structures cost far more than the students were paying, or the faculty were paying, or the you and I were paying. Uh, so I thought that was inefficient. The marginal cost of, of, of new parking was, was far greater than the price that we were paying for it. Uh, and that was, you know, that was considered sort of devilish of me to do this. It is evil to point this out. Uh, um, but I, I pushed the idea uh, that it was unpopular enough to, to, to shut me up. They said, well, why don't you go look at the other campuses on the West Coast? And, and, uh, so they paid for a trip up and down the West Coast. And I discovered that, yes, there were other campuses that uh, offered free, free transit to all students. UC Santa Cruz, UC San Diego, uh, the University of Washington, which is uh, which at the time, I know if it still is, that UCLA always compared itself to the University of Washington as being a, a similar campus, like a, a big, a major campus with a medical school and uh, engineering school and in a big city. I don't know that maybe, maybe the, the, the Washington and UCLA are the two most uh, similarly placed schools. But anyway, they had given these uh, Free transit programs for for faculty and and staff and, have, and students and I thought it was a terrific idea, so I pushed it at UCLA uh, and I was on the advisory board for the transportation services and finally the one of the, the vice chancellors I thoroughly disliked uh, he was a total thug um, and he was. Going against it <laughs> around this big table. I won't have you name who, who it is. <laughs> you know who it is. <laughs> I know who it is, but I won't uh, suggest you don't name it. <laughs> and on the table, so I'll give it a million dollars a year. I'm sure it will fail. It was the worst decision he ever made because when we, you can remember from the year 2000 to 2003, all the students, faculty, and staff got uh, free transit. And I was able to evaluate it, what happened before and after with two graduate students. And it turned out it reduced the demand for parking by a thousand cars a day. 
and that it led to a big shift in trust and use, especially for low-income people who work at the hospital. Um, it was wildly popular, and he fought very hard to cancel it. And of course, I tried to save it. The way they, they sabotaged it was by saying, well, this is not fair. We're going to charge everybody a, a, a co-payment. You pay 50 cents um, uh, to, uh, uh, to ride. Uh, and the UCLA will subsidize the rest. So that uh, quickly uh, reduced transit ridership. And the, I think the main reason that they wanted to, to, to get rid of the free transit is that it competed with the UCLA's on-campus transportation. You know, we have our own bus service around campus. And it was much less frequent than the public transit on the blue, the blue bus. So when people wanted to go from Murphy Hall to um, the Wilshire Center, which was too far to walk for most people, they paid for the UCLA campus bus, or they could just walk down to the bus station at Hillgard, and there would be a, a bus leaving every two minutes that would take them right to the, to the Wilshire Center. And so it greatly reduced the ridership on the campus uh, system, and the ride on the campus system turned up to be $4 a ride. If you divide all the costs, divided by the number of riders, $4 a ride, and what we were paying, the blue bus was only 50 cents a ride. And so they wanted to get rid of that. But now that I kept at it, and, and I teach a course in, in, uh, in, in parking now, that I just teach one course a year, but I always bring this up. And some, most of the students get excited about it. And they, both the undergraduates and the graduates have agreed to tax themselves with their free transit. So this is the first year uh, that UCLA since 2003 has had free transit for all students and, and, and not for faculty, but all students. So we're the last campus in the UC uh, system to have free transit for all students. Now that, that, that sort of brings up a, a, an interesting question because, you know, I said for let's imagine an alternative universe in which things that happened back at, at the end of World War II that were very different from what actually occurred. But of course yes. now that they did those things didn't happen and you get kind of entrenched interests like people who run uh, bus services and parking authorities and, oh. and, and what have you. Uh, and uh, cities get built with uh, the, the, these various parking mandates built into them. So the buildings are constructed that way and uh, shopping centers and everything else is, is built around that uh, around oh, that requirement. So if you change the rules after the fact, so now we've done it a certain way. Now we go to something else. Um, how much actual change can you get uh, in the grand scheme of things? Well, we'll never, we'll never get back to what we would have been. Uh, the, 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 the lecture engineer is talking about hysteresis. Hysteresis meaning that once you bend something out of shape with a, like a magnet and you take the force off, it doesn't go back to what it had been. Uh, that is permanently changed. Right. And so I think there's a lot of hysteresis that, that, that we've had this, these codes running in the background, uh, like minimum parking requirements. So you, you don't know why, but you go to Ralph's or any other grocery store that there'll be free parking. You, you expect it. It's been there for as long as you knew. Well, why is it? Because there's a code running in the background uh, that says you can't have a, a grocery store unless it has much more space, much more land for parking than for the grocery store. When you look at the, when you look at it from above, the grocery stores are are, are in a sea of parking. Um, so I think that uh, that it, it, it's like a computer code that that normally it makes the, the computer work better, but the the zoning. The, the parking requirements of zoning are more like malware that they make the system work bad or worse. <laughs> you got it. How did you do that? <laughs> well, there, there, there's your parking center. <laughs> well, that's not, so and most people don't know why that happens, but it, what it means is that 
just because the driver parks free doesn't mean the cost goes away. The cost is still there. Uh, and, and who pays it? Well, the, 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 the grocery prices are higher to pay for all of that. Um, and so people who are too poor to own a car have to uh, pay higher prices for groceries so richer people can park free. So I think you know, that seems to be just devastating to me, but it's hard to get through to people that this is what, what's happening, except that now that uh, the, these uh, grocery stores, uh, they can be redeveloped, all the strip malls, they can be redeveloped at much higher densities. And that grocery store could be uh, uh, torn down and uh, they, uh, uh, could have uh, housing at, uh, maybe facing the street and a grocery store behind it. I think that if we had always required that the parking be behind the building, uh, LA would look a lot better than it does now. But I think that, yes, that, that, that these things are happening. In fact, that I was on the Westwood Design Review Board for eight years, and that's where I learned all about anything I know about actual city planning. And uh, uh, Northwestwood Village, uh, right next to the campus, is a, 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 a great student uh, residential area. It's about uh, 15 blocks. Uh, uh, and was built in the 1920s as a, a 1930s as a very upper class uh, uh, apartment uh, style housing there. But it's like many neighborhoods next to a next to a campus that's been taken over by students who live you know, three or four people per bedroom and they pay higher rents than richer people would for you know, one uh, for, for the same apartment uh, but the city has required three and a half parking spaces per dwelling unit if it has more than uh, four rooms and the kitchen counts as a room uh, so that it's been hard to redevelop it in higher density and if it is uh, you have to dig a gigantic hole underneath it for the required parking. Uh, but now the state has prohibited the, uh, the, this parking requirement and I'm talking to the design review board planner. And he said that there the, the, uh, quite a few new buildings that have been, um, uh, uh, they've applied for, for building permits because they don't have to provide parking and they can build for students who can walk to campus. So I think that there will be a lot of change that will be uh, leading to a higher density of people and a lower density of cars, which is what we want. Well, uh, with, that, uh, uh, with that thought in mind, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this uh, interview. Uh, I gather what you're saying is uh, we, we're in a, a world of incremental change now. Uh, and uh, we'll be seeing the effects of uh, the uh, of the impact of some of your writings and books and so on uh, uh, into the into the future. And uh, our descendants may <laughs> may finally get back to that uh, alternative universe. Well, thanks very much. I just should leave without saying that that is not a typical parking lot. That is full. Most of the parking lots <laughs> are never more than full. <laughs> not a typical parking lot. Sure. Oh, farewell. Well, it's all talking to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Don.